We're here at EAA AirVenture Oshkosh 2018 to look at an aircraft we've been following for a while and it appears to have come a little bit farther. I'm Dan Johnson talking with Richard Hogan about commuter craft and in the order of things as I've understood them to go in the airframe business, you start off with something called a proof of concept and then you build a pre-production prototype which leads ultimately to final production but a pre-production machine is one you're doing in more the way you plan to manufacture the aircraft. Is that what we're looking at here, Richard? Yes, Dan, it is. Basically, this aircraft was built completely in the production molds that we're using to go into production. There are some internal parts that will be built in the first few examples of this that will not be molded so that we can validate fits and locations of certain uh, systems and components. Then we'll come back and finalize tooling for that as we enter true general production. The first few planes will actually be built by what we call alpha builders, experienced builders who will help us go through this process and then their aircraft will be part of the fleet. Yes. How much time do you have on that one? So that ship one, basically we uh, had a little over 40 hours of total uh, testing time on that aircraft. It gave us a good indication of all the key flight control issues that we would have on our somewhat unique three surface design. Okay, and now then you've built another model. That's this one here. That Has is this correct. particular one flown yet? This one is not flown. Okay. It's very close. Basically, when we get back uh, to Georgia, it'll take about two weeks to get the last few things tweaked and ready to go start flying it. Okay, so what was the, ex the flying experience on the uh, your number one ship there? Uh, give us, a, give us a, a short history of how that worked out as far as what you expected and what the results were, Richard. Well, Dan, in the first version, we were trying to prove that uh, our system as a three-surface aircraft really was stall spin resistant and yet had the low speed handling characteristics that we were shooting for. It was really turned out to be much closer to what we wanted to go to the market with than we thought. Uh, people loved the white cabin. They loved a lot of things about this airplane, even though we knew we would not go to production with it. So through the flight test, we validated the key performance issues. We had the top end performance, 200 mile an hour uh, top end performance, and it gave us the confidence to move forward and move into production. We knew that we needed to make a few changes. Fortunately, the marketplace gave us good feedback to where to focus those efforts. So we made the aircraft easier to get into and add additional baggage space. And that's what ultimately led to this design. Okay, and so to summarize some of the differences that you just mentioned there, what did you do to make those things happen? Well, a lot of what we learned out of Ship One, it was that by, we thought we were going to be able to have baggage space in the tunnel. Didn't turn out we utilized that space. In the tunnel. Actually, where the console is between the seats. And okay. of course, this is not a common thing for a lot of small no, airplanes. No, it's not. That's why I wanted to define that term. So this uh, console is almost a foot wide. It's almost a foot tall. And basically, it provides a service tunnel from the nose gear all the way back to the firewall. Now, all uh, control linkages and electrical equipment all the plumbing is run through that service tunnel so that it's easy for someone to do an annual. They don't have to pull up a piece of carpet. For me, that's a big thing. And that's probably why you've got this uh, mirror on the floor here. The camera can't tell what's going on with that, I know, but there's a shiny surface down here underneath. Why would that be? I'm yeah. guessing for that reason you just described. Is that correct? Exactly. We want people to see that. Uh, it's quite an extra feature for someone who's trying to take care of their own airplane. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, so this is a home built aircraft, so That's the correct. home builder will be able to do all the maintenance and you're not going to have to stand on your head to get underneath things just to be able to work on them. Is that right? That is correct. The maintenance aspect of this is something that I think you perfect in, in that refinement error as you're going towards production. We also have essentially an access port in the, the nose of the aircraft for the same reason. You take that access, open that access port and you've got direct access to the back of all of your instruments and so you can do all of your electrical work standing up I don't have to outside lay on the, the outside of the aircraft. Not yes, laying down on the floor looking up and not being able to get your hands where they need to be. Yes. Which is how it is on most aircraft to be honest. So, Okay, so I want to back up just a little bit again for those that may not have followed what you meant by that. Describe the three surfaces. Okay, in this aircraft we wanted stall spin resistance. That is 
uh, widely accomplished through canard aircraft. They'll have a small wing in the front, then your main wing, and the front wing is designed so that it will stall, always stall first, so you could never stall the main wing. So the, the, can, the canard stalls, the nose drops, and the main wing is uh, then restored to flight? That is correct. Okay. But we wanted to carry that a step further. We wanted good low speed handling characteristics. This, uh, this characteristic that uh, stall spin resistance is generally achieved basically by putting additional wing loading on the canard. It means that generally your landings have to be a little faster. Ah. I wanted this to be a good airplane for a low time pilot. So by adding the third surface, a traditional tail to that canard configuration, we now have authority in the pitch control to land at much slower speeds. We don't get a traditional canard bop. You don't ever reach a point where that canard where it just drops hunts. out. Yes. Yeah. And that's what the problem is on, a, on a, a traditional canard that keeps you from landing slow is, is that you can't take a chance on that nose dropping out from under you when you're 10 feet off the runway. All right. So this gives us the ability to have that slower uh, landing approach and it also keeps us from having the nose drop out from under you. When you get too slow, it just starts mushing. It just won't lift the nose anymore and, uh, and you settle into a, about a 700 foot a minute descent. And so even if you get caught off guard on turning base to final, one of the most dangerous environments Indeed. for a pilot, uh, all will happen is that it just will start sinking and you go, oh, I need to put a little power in here and uh, get the airplane straightened back up. Okay, so you did some flying. Uh, you did your 40 hours or more on the, your, what you're calling your ship one, your, uh, your proof of concept aircraft. And what were the results in these particular areas of stall and low speed handling? How, were, how satisfied were you with that? We're very happy with it, Dan. We wound up with a, what we weren't sure is if the computer projections were going to be correct on what the low speed was going to be. We can operate the aircraft down to approximately 50 miles an hour. Uh, without and, and then you sink into that uh, mush type condition but uh, so we had it basically allows us to come over the fence at 65 or 70 and settle onto the runway between 55 and 60 which is exactly yeah. what our and for a speedy were. airplane that you're capable of higher speeds those are very low approach speeds we think it gives us a very good performance envelope yeah I would think so as well what's next what do you expect next out of first uh, your flight test program and then gearing up for production we are confident enough in that that we do have our first two alpha builders already started construction. Ah, we don't okay. think there's going to be any major changes. Somebody says, well, I want it, but I'm not one of those alpha guys right. or gals. Uh, what would you tell them about the delivery point of the aircraft? Basically, uh, the, the intent here is for this, this aircraft will be built by the customers in the factory. So they will come to our factory ah, and build okay. 51%. They're going to do it right there in front of you. That's right. Okay. So when ultimately this non-alpha builder gets ready to build his aircraft, he'll come in and build it there so that helps give quality and then we'll, once he's done his 51%, we'll step in to take care of the engine installation and do the rest of the value for him and get him a flying airplane. That way he's not spending seven years building uh, an airplane of his dreams. He's only spending about three months. His actual investment in time is more like three weeks. So we get him through that building process, get him flying, we'll do the test flying for the first four hours, and then help give him additional transition training so that he's comfortable with the airplane before he takes over. For, it, it is an all composite aircraft. It's almost 100% carbon fiber, so we build a very strong uh, frame, provides a great deal of protection, but it also allows us to have a relatively low part count, and that's part of what makes this uh, work. It isn't just in the part count though. When we built our first horizontal stabilizer, it took us almost 100 hours. The new ones take about two. <laughs> so right? it's wow. a tremendous difference through tooling so that there's takes all the guest work out, it's repeatable, all the holes are match drilled, so if someone has to have a replacement part, they order it, we send it, they bolt it right in. So we think that adds a lot of value for the customer, but it also helps even the insurance companies understand that uh, they have a repeatable cost model for anything that they've got to cover. Sure, very important quality. Before we wrap up here, let's touch on one other aspect that we really want to pay a little bit of attention to, and that's the power plant. Yes, You're sir. going to be using one of the Titan line. Tell us what your plans are with regard to that, Richard. 
Right now we're looking at two engines to offer for builders of this aircraft. One is the Titan IO340 and the other is the IO370. In this particular aircraft we've gone with the 370, basically a 200 horsepower engine uh, connected to a constant speed prop. We're using MT for the prop on okay. this and uh, we think that's going to give us almost the ideal power plant combination to really utilize the aerodynamics of this airplane, get the most performance out of it. What we've done is, it's a little untraditional in the kit plane market, if we've gone to uh, three basic different models. We say you can enter with a VFR package that gives you a carbon fiber aircraft, all of this performance, 180 horsepower engine, a fixed pitch prop, wonderful combination for a guy that's VFR and wants to do a little cross country. If he's really serious about cross country, he can step up to a more advanced package with dual screens, go to the 200 horsepower and the constant speed prop, and then he can step up from that to the IFR package. We have a few options, but we've found that consistently across our customer base, these three packages cover what people do and we want to make sure we get people in the right combination for how they're going to fly the plane. Sounds like you've been planning ahead on this pretty good, Richard. Thank well, you. I pumped you for a lot of questions here. I know you still got some work to do, but you've come a long way with it. Congratulations. Thank you. Tell us how people can contact you on the web to find more information or maybe place that order. Yes, they can reach us at cleatercraft.com. Uh, we uh, do have a lot of information and we're making some new changes to the website that they'll be excited about. They can actually design their interior uh, with an interactive uh, uh, new system. That's coming out within the next week or two. So all right, we so think check they'll back. By the time this video comes out, you'll probably have that up. We'll be a little while getting it all ready for us. But sure. uh, that sounds great. More information about this aircraft we've had in the past and lots of others in the affordable aviation space available on bydanjohnson.com. Thanks for joining Richard Hogan and myself here at Oshkosh at AirVenture 2018. Thank you, Dan.